Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by NXP with our partners Persepio and Crank Software. Today, we'll be discussing how to create exceptional user interfaces using the I.MX RT crossover MCUs and taking into account valuable real-time behavioral insight gained from Persepio and Crank Software. Today's panelists include Shelby Unger, Graphics Lead for the MCU Ecosystem Team at NXP, Johan Kraft, CEO and Founder of Persepio, Gary Clarkson, Field Application Engineer from Crank Software, and Scott Snyder, Product Marketing Manager from Crank Software. During the webinar, you can type in your questions in the question box found in the GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side. We will address as many questions as possible during the live Q&A at the end of the webinar. In a few moments, I'll be spend, sending a link to view the presentation material should you want to download and follow along. With that said, I'll hand it off to Shelby Unger from NXP. Great, thank you very much, Megan. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. <clears throat> uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, I know we have a lot of material that we're gonna be covering today, so I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into a quick intro um, into the I.MXRT series and MSU Expresso. <clears throat> So for those not familiar with the I.MXRT crossover MCUs, uh, this series of devices was really designed to bridge the gap between applications, processors, and MCUs, and enable designers to more easily scale between the two. And they offer a high level of integration and security um, while still maintaining MCU level usability, uh, which makes them really ideal for applications that require embedded graphical user interfaces. So this is our current I.MXRT portfolio, uh, the I.MXRT 1050, 1060, 1064, and 1170 are the parts that are really going to be best for creating um, applications that include an embedded GUI. Uh, they all have features such as LCD and camera interfaces um, and hardware, different types of hardware acceleration, um, and they're all currently supported by uh, Crank Software. So during the live demo today, um, that will feature the I.MXRT1060 evaluation kit. Uh, this device is really well suited to embedded graphics applications uh, for a few different reasons. Um, so first, it supports um, high performance real-time processing. Um, it can operate at a core speed of up to 600 megahertz and has ultra fast responsiveness. And then second and more important, uh, the Ida MXRT 1060 supports product designs that include advanced multimedia for GUI um, and enhanced HMI experiences. So it features an enhanced LCD interface, which supports various different types of LCD panels, and then also includes the PXP 2D graphics acceleration engine, which supports functions such as color scaling, overlay with alpha blend, um, image rotation, and color space conversions. These features are also included on the RT1050 and RT1064, and then the 1170 as well, um, which in addition to these includes a MIPI DSI and then a, an on-chip GPU. <clears throat> uh, so all of the IDA-MXRT devices and general purpose MCUs are supported by our MCU Expresso ecosystem. Um, so at the heart of this ecosystem, it are the core technologies which NXP provides as a cohesive set of software and tools for designing with NXP MCUs. So this includes the integrated development environment, software development kit, uh, configuration tools, and secure provisioning tools. These software and tools have all been specifically designed to work together in a very efficient and streamlined manner. And then the core MCU Expresso technologies are also enhanced by uh, the enabling software and tools technologies, which are provided by NXP and our partners such as Crank and Percipio, 
Um, this includes anything from runtime software and middle, middleware, uh, partner IDEs like IAR and Kyle, um, different debug probes and development boards. And these all work really seamlessly with our core technologies and help to speed up the development process even further, allowing you to focus more on differentiation. Um, so as part of these enabling software technologies, um, an evaluation version of Crank's storyboard is actually available inside of the MC Expresso SDK for supported IDA MXRT series devices. Um, so the experience of using storyboard with NXP devices is now uh, quite seamless. So if you want any more information on um, any of the different MC Expresso software and tools or graphics on NXP microcontrollers, um, you can take a look at any of these links. They'll be available in the presentation that uh, Megan will link to. And with that, I'll pass it off to Scott to tell you a little bit more about Crank Software. Thank you, Shelby. All right. So hopefully everybody's seeing my screen. Thank you uh, for taking time out of your busy day to come uh, listen to us speak to you about uh, all the great things that uh, we have to offer you to make the development of your next product a little bit smoother and a little bit uh, easier. So definitely when it comes to developing UIs for today's embedded products, things have really become increasingly more challenging. You know, user expect expectations uh, have been elevated with uh, today's consumers expecting an intuitive and modern touch experience, not only from the physical hardware, but, you know, the quality and smoothness of the experience that the graphical user interface also provides. And this, of course, has become that we all have, whether it's in our pockets or our purses, a really powerful device with a touchscreen that has really set the expectations uh, for today's uh, consumer market. So with that, the user experience has really quickly become a defining part of today's products with its UI being one of the main factors that products are, are being measured on and what often drives the value that consumers see in the product and also what helps drive their purchasing decisions. Also, integrating evolutions in technology uh, doesn't mean only making hardware decisions anymore and how they will be incorporated but it's, it's how those technologies will be incorporated into the user interface. And of course, it goes without saying that, you know, any time that's lost or, or resources wasted or coding changes that need to occur, whether it's because of, of, of elements that come across later in development, which we'll be talking about uh, today, these all create delays in, in really getting the product to market on time. And of course, you know, on budget. And so that's why Storyboard was designed. It was really designed to remove the barriers or the issues that are typically associated with UI design and development. It was based upon over two decades of experience in, in designing and implementing embedded GUI solutions for a broad range of industries. The founders of Crank Software really set out a couple of decades ago to build a solution that could really help remove the inefficiencies that often frustrated them and their developer colleagues when it came to developing UIs uh, for embedded devices. So, you know, if you haven't heard of Crank Software before this, uh, this session, I can guarantee you that at some point in time, uh, either you or the customers that you're building for have actually used a product running a UI that was built uh, using our UI development software storyboard. And in case this is the first time you've, you know, you've heard about Crank Software, just let me give you a little brief introduction. Crank Software is a software and services based company, which means that not only do we develop the storyboard UI development uh, tool, but we also provide professional services, which means that, you know, if you're stuck at any point, whether it may be at the beginning phase and you need to quickly prototype to, to show value to your executive team in the product, or maybe you're, you're using Storyboard and, and maybe you're stuck at a, a stage where, um, you know, maybe you want some more fine tuning and you want to look to some, some UI experts. Or maybe you just don't have the manpower uh, in-house and you don't have the time to go out and hire and train. Scrank Software is there to really help you at any stage uh, during the uh, development cycle.
So our leadership team has an extensive background in embedded graphics and systems with over 20 years experience. And we do have a large global customer footprint from uh, Fortune 500 companies down to small organizations. And we have hundreds of millions of devices that are out there in the field uh, running a store work, storyboard built uh, UI. Plus, we also ax, uh, offer access to a global distribution partnership network, really providing you localized uh, support, uh, depending if you're outside of the North American region. So how can Storyboard help you? Well, powerfully simple, yet sophisticated. That is what our customers tell us uh, when it comes to using our, our UI design and development tool. Uh, it's, it's easy to use interface really enables them to create UIs quicker and more efficiently. And this is done because what we've done is we've decoupled the front end UI uh, design from the back end logic, uh, really enabling the designer and the developers of a UI to kind of work in parallel when building the UI application. So you know, Storyboard really makes it easy to get started early on the UI design. It allows uh, you to really easily embrace design iterations and helps reduce the complexity of really developing UI solutions uh, for an ever uh, evolving embedded hardware uh, world or even maybe multiple product lines uh, that you have. So, you know, when it comes down to it, it just really helps in, in, in you develop faster um, UIs or faster products, helping you get to, to market faster. So let me explain a little bit how that kind of all kind of works. When it comes down to accelerated development, UI development can really be fast-tracked by starting the UI design in tools such as Photoshop or Sketch. And once they are ready, they can be easily imported into Storyboard. And there they become the building blocks of the UI. And from there, those, those building blocks can be brought to life using Storyboard's integrated animation tools, uh, allowing you to create, edit, and review animations all directly within the tool. Uh, critical usability testing um, or, or gaining stakeholder feedback can really all be achieved easily with the prototyping tools, allowing you to kind of really move that project along. And then, of course, you know, if you, you want to have that uh, hands on kind of testing experience, it can be the UI can be ported to mobile devices, whether it's a tablet or, or, or Android phone to really kind of have that kind of hands on experience. And then, of course, once the UI development begins, uh, designers and developers can continue working in Storyboard's parallel workflow environment that really helps remove the pain and struggle uh, associated with iterations uh, that naturally occur uh, during uh, the development of embedded products. So what it comes down to, it's not a matter of if design changes are going to happen. It's a matter of when, because everybody uh, has an, uh, an opinion, whether it's the button needs to be bigger or smaller, needs to be blue, needs to be over to the left, to the right. Uh, so really what Storyboard allows you to do is introduce design changes without impacting the progress or, or causing a complete teardown of code. Um, the designer can completely modify the U, UI look uh, within their design tool, say Photoshop, and then simply re-import those Photoshop design files uh, back into Storyboard without having to create an entirely new application or overriding the prior development efforts that were done. Uh, even more importantly, uh, you're allowed to remain in control of those iterations through uh, our unique graphical compare and merge tool. Uh, so it's a great little something that, that we bring to the table that uh, other development tools don't have that allow you to kind of take a look um, at what the changes were made and you can select simply select all or you can simply select and choose which ones you want to merge back into uh, the actual UI allowing for a more efficient or organized workflow in particular when you have uh, multiple people uh, working um, on that project whether they're located in the same office or across uh, across the globe. And then even with the vast choices of hardware and operating system combinations that you have, it's highly likely that we run on it. And that's because Storyboard was created to be platform agnostic so that you and our customers can really de-risk the projects that, that you're creating by introducing a framework that easily supports uh, changes in the technology stack at any point in time. So say, for example, you started developing with the 1060, but then, it, you know, you're, you're, you're moving along the development cycle and maybe the 1170 is now introduced and you think, 
this is something that I want to take advantage of in my products. Well, the beautiful thing about it is that Storyboard provides your UI flexibility. So whether it's scalability to move from MPUs to MCUs or vice versa, or portability, allowing you to switch out parts of your technology stack. So whether it's hardware or the software, but still retain the benefits of, of your, your UI, or even reusability, which allows you to you know, take that GUI you created for one project and easily move it over to another project. So maybe you have a multiple project line, product lines from low end to high end, and you want to have that consistent look, touch, and feel. Storyboard really allows you to, to easily achieve that. So ultimately, when it comes down to it, what makes Storyboard different is that we're not a code generation framework. And so what this allows you to do is really lowers the barrier for entry for software development. So now you don't need to have uh, a large team of, of software coders working in C++ to do all this massive coding, which then when changes need to occur, you need to kind of reverse that coding that was done. And this is all because, like I said, we've decoupled that front end UI from that back end logic. But we have this well-defined uh, data model and events API that sits in between that, that allows for this clean separation separation between the UI development and hardware deployment, really helping uh, your UIs to be more resilient to uh, those design changes. Um, also, like I said, you know, unique features such as Storyboard's graphical compare and merge tool really enables your teams to remain in control of those UI refinements. And of course, uh, you know, we work closely with, with partners like NXP to really kind of do extensive development and testing to ensure that our storyboard engine really takes advantage of specific board features such as uh, whether it's proprietary graphic libraries or 2D, 3D hardware acceleration and memory management functions. And I'll call one out specifically, uh, working with the folks at uh, NXP and with the, the 7 ULP, um, which had both a 2D and a 3D component to it, we created something unique um, that was hybrid rendering, which really allowed you to, to leverage both engines at the same time. So you could have a mix of, of 2D and 3D, but in a power efficient way. So instead of having to fully utilize the 3D engine for both 2D graphics and 3D graphics, you could dynamically on the fly use 3D for th the 3D, and you could use the 2D engine for 2D, really saving on power consumption. So with that being said, uh, before we actually jump back to the demo, I'm going to actually kind of pass things over uh, to Johan here, and he's going to provide you an introduction to Persepio. My name is uh, Johan Kraft. I'm a CEO, CTO, and founder of Persepio. Most embedded software is written in C or C++, but this language does not completely specify the runtime behavior, and the runtime behavior is what ultimately counts, right? The static source code is of course fundamental, but it does not give the full picture since the runtime behavior also depends on dynamic effects, for instance variations in timing and interference between tasks or threads. Such dynamic effects are emergent properties that are not visible in the source code. To get the full picture you also need runtime monitoring. There are at least three types of runtime monitoring. The most common one is probably application logging where printf debugging is a prime example. This is very flexible, just insert some print statements and you get a textual log of your application. However, this is often associated with a considerable overhead. Outputting a string of say 15 characters over a UART at 115 kilobots takes about one millisecond, which is unacceptably slow in many situations. Moreover, it's often not appreciated to have printf lines all over the code. On the other end of the scale we have instruction trace, where the data is not generated by software but by the processor core. This means essentially zero overhead, but the scope is limited by the hardware implementation. For instance, it's often not possible to record function parameters, return values or local variables. This also requires expensive bulky equipment and you need a processor and a board that supports high-speed trace ports. Moreover, this produces a very large amount of data on low abstraction level that can be difficult to overview and analyze. A middle path is uh, software event tracing. This has the flexibility of application logging, but is much faster measured in microseconds per event. Moreover, the instrumentation is typically predefined within the Artos or middleware APIs, so you don't have to insert a lot of printf statements in your code. 
At Persepia, we currently focus on software event tracing and application logging. Persepia provides visual trace diagnostics, which is not just a tool for runtime monitoring, but a solution for efficiently gaining actionable insights throughout the development process. We combine efficient solutions for runtime monitoring with advanced data processing that actually understands the meaning of the events and builds an OS-aware model of the recorded data. This is made accessible and really nice to use via bespoke data visualizations with over 30 interactive views from different perspectives and at different abstraction levels. Tracealyzer is our analysis and visualization tool for trace data. It also provides live real-time recording capability for FreeRTOS, SafeRTOS and MicroC OS 3. It also supports other real-time kernels and operating systems via third-party tracers. It is ideal for system-level debugging and works a bit like a surveillance camera for your embedded software, where you can identify issues in high-level overviews and then zoom in to see specific events in detail to understand the cause of the problem. DevAlert is our new service for IoT devices that allows for direct feedback from customer operation or from field testing regarding runtime errors and other software events of interest. As you know, software is rarely bug-free, even at release. And the sooner you can become aware of missed bugs and fix them, perhaps via an over-the-air update, the fewer customers will be affected. If you react and deploy a correction fast enough, most of your customers probably won't be affected or even notice the bug in the first place. DevAlert is a cloud service that provides a DevOps-style feedback loop from the devices back to the developers, and also provides traces for remote diagnostics and tracealyzer. We provide a reference implementation for AWS, but other cloud vendors can also be supported. You find more information about Devalert at httpsperceptio.com slash Devalert. Thanks very much for the product overview of tracealyzer, Johan. Um, let's move on to the storyboard demo side of things now. So first I'll give you a quick overview of the demo we're going to show you. Uh, this, is, um, this is going to be based on the IMAX RT1060. Uh, this is the EVK board. And if I quickly show you the demo application, uh, I'll load this up in a moment inside of Storyboard and show you how it runs. Uh, but essentially it's, uh, it's based on a white goods demo uh, for a wash machine. And we're using the, the, the hardware on the uh, the EVK board. So if you've not seen this, it's a 480 by 272 uh, LCD panel with a capacitive touchscreen. And in our demo, we'll be configuring Storyboard to run on the free RTOS uh, OS with the, the MCU Ex Expresso IDE runtime. Um, we're, we're also using uh, PXP animation based uh, hardware acceleration and uh, we'll be using a virtual file system. Uh, so this is storyboard deployed not in uh, in file form but uh, but in a head of file form for incorporation and build into your application so this is using our c or c++ resource header format so if i show the application now this is storyboard desktop um this is the 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 screens the raw screens that we have um you can see we've got a number of screens. We've got some animation here, and uh, this uh, this first screen, when I show you it running, uh, is um, is using a touch interface, uh, and this allows you to scroll up and down and interact with the the, the display. So this will be uh, running here in our simulator. And if I show you the the kind of activity, this is a, a touch. If this was a touch screen, I would be uh, scrolling up and down, and we can. We can hit start and, uh, and it's a simulating a, a wash machine application. Okay, so that's what we're going to run our target. Um, it's uh, it's pretty good. Um, we've we've got this uh, set up to run pretty smoothly, and uh, well, we'll hopefully show you that next. So we're running on the board. Uh, what we've done is we've used a configuration called the LPC Link 2 configuration. This um. This allows you to set up the board in a special mode, which uh, gives you a much faster flashing um, and also, crucially, some a a additional uh, trace options. So we're going to be using the uh, the SWO, the single wire output trace uh, for, for real time trace output while we're debugging the application. You can see here um, there's an application note on our website uh, and also there's a couple of little jumpers and things that you have to change to the board. Um, 
Of note here is that you need to power this using the external power configuration, which is what we're showing here. So uh, normally you can run the board with uh, with just a USB connection, um, but in this case you need to uh, configure to the external power, which I've got here. So back in the application, um, this is Storyboard Designer Desktop again. What we'll show you is, uh, is how we've configured this for export. So we'll be using a virtual file system on our target. So I'll be choosing the virtual file system and I've actually prepared a configuration here, which, um, which allows us to tune the application for uh, flash versus memory. Uh, you, what you can see here is we've got lots of images and we're going to be looking at nine megabytes. This is for the animation. We're using a flip uh, chart animation. So the spinning drum you saw is using lots of uh, background images you can see here. So uh, we're going to be to queue those up uh, and we're also going to store them in a compressed file store, file format. So we'll be using uh, not, not as much uh, flash, but um, a reasonable amount of, uh, of the SD RAM. OK, so using that configuration, um, we can export the uh, C, C++ header file. Um, we're going to be generating a model file, um, SB Engine model at H with the embedded resources in um, and I'll run that. Uh, it takes a it takes a little time to do. So um, what I've also done is prepared one here. So uh, in this export file, we um, we'll have a binary representation in a C C++ header format of the the images, the resources, uh, and everything else. Um, so we'll be we'll be using that in our application, and we're going to be building it in as part of the uh, the, the source code. So now let's take a look at the uh, source code side of things. So I'll switch over here to uh, my MCU Expresso IDE. And what I've done is I've loaded up uh, an application uh, which is based on one of the two sample apps, the Coffee app and the Hello app, uh, which we include in the um, NXP SDK for the uh, platform uh, IMX RT 1060 and 1050. So that's included in the SDK download as middleware. You can download that and try it yourself. So uh, what I have is uh, I've modified this to to add a couple of extra tasks. So we've got storyboard engine main task. This is the GUI task. We've also got an additional task for input. This is going to be polling the uh, the touchscreen, and a couple more tasks. Hello and loading are, are meant to simulate additional uh, features and and behaviours on the board. So this is maybe a state machine or some other UI control. Uh, loading task here is simply blinking an LED and uh, and doing some GPIO. So if I switch over to uh, the storyboard task, um, this is going to be running. Uh, what I've done is I've enabled um, some logging here. Uh, so this is storyboard internal logging. So we use this to help diagnose issues um, and to look at performance behaviors on a, on a target. Um, this allows us really to look from the inside of storyboard outwards. Uh, and this gives us a really good insight into the kind of information that uh, that's uh, going on. Uh, and it uh, helps us to highlight performance issues. Now, what this application is currently configured to is, uh, is to show kind of uh, some some loaded behavior, some behavior that's not ideal. So if I uh, switch over to so you can show the uh, board webcam. I'll hit run there. Uh, first thing you see is it takes a little bit of time to start up. So that's uh, loading up there. And, uh, and if I zoom in a little, When I'm moving the screen up and down with touch, it's a bit laggy. You can see there's a, a kind of a, a notchy behavior on the lag uh, behind the touch input there. Uh, and it's kind of hard to see, but uh, there's, the animation's not as smooth as it could be. Okay. So what I can do now is, uh, is make use, if I pause that and reset. Okay, restart again. What I can do is make use of our SWO output here. So um, the, the storyboard trace that I enabled uh, is now piped directly to the output of the board, the debugger back channel, the SWO output. And that allows us to capture a whole load of trace information from storyboard as we're running. So if I run this again, you can see here we're outputting a whole load of internal trace data coming out of the, uh, the trace port here. Um, that's the initial startup. Uh, and we're going to be doing some 
uh, scrolling there and let's do the animation again okay and cancel that and reset and let's stop it there okay so all of this information from boot up uh, is now collected in my trace output uh, I can save that to a file this is going to be a plog file okay and this is the kind of file that um, that storyboard is able to, to load um, so if I switch back to storyboard uh, these files are saved in um, in plog form and you're able to poll them to, to kind of load and deconstruct them inside of storyboard and this is our own internal trace information so you can see here that um, that we, we've got some uh, screens being shown you can see the average redraw times uh, and this this kind of detailed information is very good at analyzing storyboard behaviors but it doesn't really tell us much about the um, outside world so the external influences on storyboard which are affecting its behavior so uh, you can see here we've got some additional tracing for graphs and redraw times uh, and that allows our engineers to, to capture this trace and uh, and uh, in our customers can share them with us and we're able to really do some deep dive diagnostics and I can drill now into into the home screen and some timers feedback so this is uh, this is all of the activities inside of storyboard and uh, you can see here inside of the uh, the washing screen this is where we had the animation run you can see each time we redraw the screen we're, we're looking at uh, you know at drawing uh, drawing a new image so this is kind of a flipbook animation so this is really very useful information uh, to allow you to to diagnose things but as I said before it's not necessarily the full story so this is where Persepio comes in really um, so what I've done is I've uh, I've added some additional uh, trace capability so Persepio provide a bunch of code here which you can integrate into your application um, in this case we're using the uh, the snapshot mode um, so what I can do is now I'm on a halted breakpoint uh, I can pull back uh, a whole bunch of different um, captures so let me just do that now I'll reset to the beginning so we've got a clean state um, and what I can do is I'll go into our application task here and set a breakpoint on the first screen that's shown um, so so here this is a display in it is when we're we're setting up the application um, and here display update is called every time we've got something to to display uh, you'll see here that I, I've included a few extra uh, trace outputs uh, so this is uh, this is going to allow us to uh, to basically uh, add some detail to the Persepio trace so if I hit that again um, I'm going to run that. Uh, we'll see the same startup. It's going to load up the application and then I'm hitting the breakpoint. Okay, so if I had that so you can see it. Uh, what I can do now is uh, is hit the um, plugin from Persepio, which allows me to save a snapshot trace. So that's going to use our logging and tracing we've added with backtrace capability to pull back all of this information. Um, this will be analyzed in a, in a moment so uh, that's going to pull back a, a log file and um, extract the data straight out of the, the memory and load up inside of uh, the Persepio Tracerizer tool as you can see it loading here So what's interesting is, um, and I'll, I'll let um, I'll let the guys from Persepio talk a bit more detail about this. Uh, you can see here we've got a capture from startup. Um, so now we've got a, a log file here. We are able to share that with a Persepio team, and they'll do some debugging. Um, so we've got our trace log captured now. Uh, that's ready to be shared. Um, by way of handover, I'd like to uh, just to recap what we're looking for here. Um, so. 
Some of the startup time was not what I was expecting. So uh, we're looking at optimizing startup. Some of the animation could be improved and general performance. Uh, I think there's areas where we can look at there in more detail and also uh, investigating why there was this uh, apparent lagginess on the uh, on the touchscreen interface. Um, and that was uh, visible in the menu. So uh, let's hand over to Johan. Uh, I've shared this this file already uh, and let's look in more detail using the Tracelizer tool. With Tracelizer, we can get a broad picture of the behavior at system level. This is a general tool for visual trace diagnostics that can be useful in many types of embedded applications. This system runs an Artos kernel that provides preemptive priority-based multitasking. This is an efficient and convenient way to handle multiple tasks in parallel, such as waiting for touch input while updating animations on the screen and also responding to network messages, for instance. When using an Artos, the tasks are essentially running as separate programs, ideally with one responsibility each. The Artos kernel rapidly switches the executing task as needed and gives an illusion of parallel processing. Tracelizer shows you exactly how the tasks are executed by the Artos kernel, as seen here on the left side. Note that the timeline is vertical in this case. There is also a horizontal mode, but the vertical mode has certain advantages, as you will see soon. Each of these columns represents a task or an interrupt handler, and each of the solid rectangles are fragments of uninterrupted execution, separated by task switches. There are several tasks in this system, and it appears as this task, SB Engine, which is currently initializing the HMI, only receives about a quarter of the processor time. The rest is mostly used up by this light green task, Loading Task. This becomes very clear in the CPU load graph, which uh, has a horizontal orientation, as, no, as you can see. And by selecting the loading task here, we can also see that, that the average value is about 72% up here in the selection details. Note that the order of the task columns and even the task colors are assigned according to their scheduling priority. This makes it easy to see that the loading task, the light green one, runs on a higher scheduling priority than the SP engine task in dark green. Most Artosis uses fixed priority scheduling. This means that higher priority tasks always get to run until they suspend themselves or are preempted by an even higher priority task, while lower priority tasks, like SB Engine in this case, has to wait for all higher priority tasks to finish. The benefit of this is complete control of the real-time behavior. The drawback is that the scheduling priorities become critical for the application behavior and performance, and it's up to the application developer to find suitable task priorities. This is perhaps easy in a toy example with two or three tasks, but can be quite complicated to get right in real applications. To see more details about what the application is doing, we can display user events, as we call them, that have been logged in the application. Note that the screen reads zoom in to show mm -hmm, number of events here. Okay, so let's zoom in a bit. So here we can see a lot of details, like individual memory allocations, for instance. But we want a bit more overview at this point, so let's change the filter instead and zoom out a bit. Now we can overview the user events from the application, and we can see events like poll input start in this yellow task called storyboard input. This seems to be related to the HMI touchscreen input, and we can measure the time between these task activations like this, and uh, see that it's approximately 200 milliseconds in between them. So it appears that the touchscreen input is only sampled with about 5 Hz, and that could explain the laggy behavior. So it seems that the problems were that the loading task were running at a too high scheduling priority and that the storyboard input task only executed every 200 milliseconds. This was just a basic example. There are a lot of other things we can see with Tracelizer, especially overviews that makes it easier to spot issues also in long traces. For instance, in the lower right you see the memory allocation over time. 
Each of these data points corresponds to a malloc or free event, and by double clicking it, we can find it in the trace. In this case, we should probably adjust this view to appear a bit better by removing the unit from the y axis and by hiding the markers for the individual events like this. Another example is the communication flow graph. This shows how the tasks are interacting in runtime and is essentially a dependency graph based on the trace data. We can click on this message queue, for instance, and see all operations performed on this object, like sending or receiving messages. This opens up the object history view, where you can double click on the events to find them in the trace. In total, Tracealizer provides over 30 different perspectives and all works like this, interactive and interconnected with other views. This makes it easier to drill down from an anomaly spotted in a high-level overview down to the detailed events to see the cause. And with that, I hand over to Gary to continue. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Johan. That was really great. Um, you can certainly see the power and the insight that uh, Tracealizer gives us uh, when uh, trying to analyze a, 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 an application in the context of uh, a wider solution. Uh, you can see the interaction between the tasks is, uh, is very hard to visualize unless you can really see what's going on. So um, just to recap where we were looking, uh, there was certainly work to be done on optimizing the boot and the general startup. Uh, we saw there's some scope for um, the improvements in the animation uh, and general smoothness of the application. And also uh, we saw that there's, uh, there's certainly something that we can do in terms of the touch response. So what I'll do is I'll switch you over to the application code and just show you the changes I've made. So the first, ta the first item that uh, was identified was the, the priority of the loading task. So in reality, this task is, is, is just a dummy task. It's, it's actually taking up lots of, uh, lots of the process of time. Um, it's also cycling around just reading, yeah, reading the GPIO pins and blinking the lights. So it's, uh, it's illustrative of, uh, of, of you know, a, general, a general task in a, in a wider system. Uh, the key thing really here was that the priority was set quite high. Um, and that was continually interrupting, as, as Johan mentioned, the, the storyboard, the SB engine task. So I've dropped that down by one. So it's at the same level of priority as the storyboard engine tasks uh, here. And uh, the second area that was identified was in relation to the touch, the touch screen interface. Um, what I did here was looked at the the polling interval we had it set to 200 milliseconds as as i was shown in the trace uh what i've done is drop that to something like 50 milliseconds so this is going to be polling much faster uh, and should give us a much a much tighter response um without the visible lag that we're seeing uh, so if i uh, if i switch over to the the board here and um show you that running so i've hit, just hit play and uh, we're going to see the initial startup there is something like two seconds previous it was around five seconds um, and I think there's there's more we can do on this by the way and I'll come on to that in a second uh, you'll see next if we look at the scrolling of the menu much more responsive much smoother so here we've removed that visible lag and that notchiness by by polling the touch screen a little bit faster and uh, finally if we pop over to the, the final screen here we're looking at the the, the rotating drum animation uh, this was the uh, this is a sequence of images queued up and played that we saw earlier um, so uh, let me show you what I did I took um, I took the the opportunity to capture another trace um, and uh, if I switch over to the trace laser view here uh, what we what we found was um was first that uh, you can see that the, the tasks have now been reordered, so the, the, the priorities are now in line. And you can see that the uh, the SB engine task is sharing much more of the process of time with the loading task, so they're much they're playing much tighter together, much more cooperative. And you see here the interval between the um, the storyboard input task, the polling of the touchscreen has been reduced, and uh, and that's that's again gives us a responsiveness. So one thing I wanted to call out was uh, would you may be wondering what the slope of the graph is here. Uh, so this is this is the memory utilization over time from startup. 
what this is, is actually doing, you see this ramp sequence here, is uh, that is preloading all of the 30 or so full screen images that we're using for the uh, animation on the rotating drum. Uh, so this is what we call a flip book animation, where we're queuing them all up and then uh, and then flipping between them uh, to call, cause you the, uh, the the kind of visual rotation. So what we could do is uh, is actually defer that 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 loading until later in the later in the application. These two notches here are uh, are actually the initial and the second screen. Uh, you see, if we if we remove or defer this uh, the loading and pre-caching until later on, just in time for the uh, animation screen, we'll be able to remove the uh, that whole two or so seconds of, of startup time that was, was taken up front and push it later on when we're not going to notice it in the application. So that's just one example of some further optimization we could do. Um, so I hope that's, um, that's really given you some valuable insights and, and how these two tools can be used together to create a, a, a fantastic user interface. Um, certainly thanks to Johan and uh, I think with that we'll, uh, we'll conclude our demo and hand it back to, uh, to the presentation. Um, and just to recap before I do that, we're going to look, we're basically we've, we've achieved our objectives. We've had a, a faster startup with much smoother animations and much smoother scrolling um, with the, the faster touch response. Okay, so uh, I'll hand it back now. Thanks, Gary. And uh, I'm going to pass things back to, to Megan and we'll just kind of wrap things up. Yes. Uh, let me share our last key takeaway. <laughs> Frozen here. That's Let's okay. Try I, that. I, I can take it from there while while we're doing that. So, so just uh, some of the key takeaways uh, from today are, are definitely, you know, if you're looking to to utilize the 1060, the RT 1060 in your next uh, embedded project, then definitely visit www.nxp.com. Uh, slash uh, IMXRT1060, and you can uh, order your own EVK, EVK kit, uh, so that way you can kind of, you know, test out the graphical performance of it for your embedded project. Also, uh, from Crank Software, we do have a 30-day uh, uh, free trial, so it's a full-featured free trial, so definitely give it a give it a download today to basically get your hands on some of the demo images that we have already pre-built for uh, the RT1060. So that way, make it a lot easier uh, to evaluate the graphical performance of it. And of course, uh, the, the folks at Percepio also have a free al um, eval version of the Tracealyzer, and you can get that from uh, percepio.com as well. So with that being said, uh, I think uh, we're gonna kind of open things up to the questions. So now is a good opportunity that yeah. if you do have any questions, uh, get them in and uh, I'll uh, pass things over to Megan. Yeah, so let's get started. It looks like we have a couple of uh, questions that have come in. Um, it looks like this first one might be for Gary, but let's see, um, all panelists are welcome to address these. So the first question is, you used the SWO feature of the debugger in the demo. Can you explain how to set things up and why use this instead of a UART? Oh, sure, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's actually a really cool feature. Um, so it's it's it uses uh, the, the the onboard the on chip debug uh, core and uh, and it only uses a single a single pin. So. Um, you're not going to be taking lots of uh, lots of I/O from different uh, application, um, you know, use cases. Um, so what we do, uh, we we've actually, um, I think, uh, I can share, uh, or maybe the um, if I post it into the view, the uh, one of the organisers can share a link. We've we've got a, a knowledge base article about going through this. You you simply just um, enable the pin in the pin mux, um, switch on one of the the, the features, uh, one of the the uh, the internal um, like uh, peripherals, uh, and that allows you to uh, to basically talk directly out of this single wire pin with a with a printf style of, of uh, statement, which is what we've uh, we've hooked in our application. So it's really easy to do. Um, it shouldn't take up any I/O resources, uh, and it allows you really to uh, to turn this on and off. Uh, in the background, so you, you're not really enabling or disabling or changing code. You can do this with uh, with just a, a single register. So uh, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty easy to do, and uh, and it's something that uh, which is enabled by the LPC Link 2 configuration of the uh, the RT1060 dev board. 
So hopefully that's answered your question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gary. And it looks like there's another one here for you um, <clears throat> with regard to the capture trace buffer. So how big is the capture trace buffer and how much memory is being reserved? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in the demo, I've, I've kind of set it up to be quite large, to be honest. So we've, we've configured it for about 400K. Now this was um, this was specifically so we could capture quite a lot of detail from uh, from startup, uh, maybe ten seconds or so, um, and it really it's uh, it's more than you would normally use. Um, so you can change this actually with um, with uh, a single uh, header define, and uh, and I think um, it's all documented in the the Sepio integration guide as well. So so uh, to answer your question, yes, yeah, about 400k. Um, we're, we're actually got lots of SD RAM on this board, so we, we chose to stick the buffer in there. Um, and yeah, well, that's, uh, that's how we set it up. Good. Thanks, Gary. Johan, we have a couple questions for uh, about Tracealyzer and Persepio. So the first one is, uh, does Persepio support to MQX? I assume that's for Tracealyzer. MQX. Uh... Uh, not yet. Uh, we are, however, working on an SDK that will allow for integrating Tracelizer with uh, various operating systems. Uh, but MQX is not one of those we have predefined support for. The ones we do support at the moment is, well, FreeRTOS in this case, SafeRTOS, MicroC OS3, ThreadX, which is now Azure RTOS. Uh, VX works. We have a new version for Linux systems coming out soon. We have a beta release next week. Um, uh, there are probably a few more, but not yet MQX. All right. Um, another question regarding Tracealyzer. The Tracealyzer demo used a breakpoint and snapshot mode, but is it possible to capture real-time traces from a live running system instead? Yes, we have uh, what we call streaming mode, where the data is transferred continuously. And this can be used over serial wire output, uh, like in this case, or with a Sager J-Link probe, for instance. And with this, we can capture basically unlimited amount of trace data, as much as you can store on your hard drive, on your desktop computer. We have done recordings of 70 hours or so, and uh, we've also ensured that Tracealyzer is able to work with that kind of, of data. I noticed in, in Gary's example that his uh, 400 kilobyte trace buffer was a bit slow to open, but that's because uh, the snapshot node was used, and that is memory optimized, so it's quite compressed. So that's 400 kilobytes is, is on the large side for a snapshot. So typically, we uh, it's more intended for traces of, of, of well down to a few kilobytes, and uh, that also allows it to, to be used in in deployed systems with a DevLat service. Okay, and then uh, a few more questions uh, for you, Johan. What kind of metrics can you analyze with Tracealyzer? Well, uh, there are a couple of kind of predefined metrics related to task scheduling, like execution time of tasks, response times, periodicity, things like that. You can get a statistics report, or you can see them plotted over a timeline to see the variations. But you can also insert your own, what we call user events that Crank used in this example, the yellow labels. And then you can, based on those custom points in the trace, you can set up your own metrics by defining what we call uh, uh, custom intervals. And then you get kind of a data set for each of these two points and can measure uh, any duration in the trace in a systematic way and see the minimum and maximum durations, etc. So that gives you a, a much more kind of system specific and more relevant metric. Um, that's more kind of user defined. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one more regarding the Dev Alert service. Can it also handle severe errors like hard faults? Yes, that's a good question because I mean, what Dev Alert does is that it allows you to report an issue to our Dev Alert service with a trace, but that requires that you upload a few kilobytes of data. And if you have a hard problem, 
that the system basically crashes, then you might not be able to do an upload. You might be in, in a weird error state. Uh, the operating system might not be running anymore. Uh, so, so that's a good question. But what we have done to handle that is that we have a built-in solution to save the data to flash. The alert is typically a few kilobytes of data, so we have a reserved uh, flash area where we can write that down. It takes a few milliseconds. And then you can restart the device. And once the system is back online again, uh, dev alert, the dev alert agent that is included in the firmware will um, find this uh, data in the flash and upload it automatically to the DevLot service. All right, thank you, Johan. Uh, now we have a few questions for um, Gary and Scott at Crank. So let's start with the first one. What is the CPU load when using Storyboard? Uh, I'll take that, Scott. Um, so it really does depend on what you're doing. So what is, what's interesting with Storyboard is that uh, we're entirely event driven. So when we're not processing some timer or scheduled based event, um, when we're not moving an animation or doing some film on screen or, or even processing a touch input, we're, we're using zero CPU. So, so we're actually blocked and halted waiting for a, the, the next event to arrive. So. Um, the complexity in the CPU loading could be obviously zero and all the way up to uh, pretty much 100% if we're running full screen animations. But um, but it's very bursty and it does actually depend on the complexity of the application as well. So um, there's no real answer. Um, you can see the the kind of uh, the kind of uh, insight that uh, that Tracelizer gives you and uh, you can you can measure this uh, dynamically. So it's a very dynamic value. Uh, but, uh, but we, we work very hard to, to keep it low and to be optimized uh, where possible using uh, hardware offloads such as the uh, PXP chip. Okay, thanks Gary. Um, one more for Storyboard. Has there been any effort or is there any plan to make Storyboard, storyboard qualified for DO178 use? Did you want to take that, Scott? I'll, I'll let you take that one because that, uh, that's uh, okay. that's new to me. I haven't heard that one. So DO one seventy eight. Uh, so uh, as far as I'm aware, I'm not no expert on on the uh, certification side of things. This is um, this is a military standard, um, and uh, it's it's not something that uh, we typically do directly. We do work where uh, for uh, automotive, medical, uh, and other um, safety critical applications. We work with customers. Um, to uh, help them certify their own application. So we're, we're pretty much part of the wider system. So we don't certify in one right, but uh, we provide the necessary information, um, traceability, testing strategies and such that, uh, that uh, feed into uh, um, you know, the, the customer themselves doing the, uh, the, the, the qualification to, to whichever standard applies. So uh, I hope, hope that's kind of answered your question, but uh, we don't support the DO standard directly, no. All right, thanks, Gary. All right, we have time for uh, two more questions. So we'll round out with uh, the, this one. How are user events connected to UI actions or changes in the display, especially using C or C++? Okay, that's cool. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's, uh, there's a, 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 an event-based mechanism, uh, which uh, Scott mentioned earlier on in the, the slide. We, we we really do try and decouple the user interface from the back end code. So whatever the machine or the, the state machine is, is doing. Um, and the way we do that is using um, an event queue uh, in each direction. We call them channels. Um, so we have a set of APIs that you can call from C or C++ um, in, in, in the, uh, the RTOS world, for example. Uh, and on uh, maybe a, a Linux platform, uh, Linux is uh, Linux is using separate tasks, so we have a storyboard engine task and maybe a you know a backend task. So uh, on um, on Linux it's a it's a system v message queue, and on a free autos it's a free autos queue, uh, free autos message queue. Um, and so you're you're injecting messages asynchronously into a queue, and the storyboard engine um, picks those up and, and processes them on demand. So uh, as we're event driven, we're not doing anything until those arrive, uh, and then when we do, we can trigger actions and behaviors in the UI um, based on those those event triggers um, and we can run custom scripts in Lua or uh, just change data values. 
So uh, it's it's very well defined. It's actually quite a simple API. Um, I believe there are uh, there are quite a few examples on our, on our website if you want to take a look, uh, and we can certainly. Uh, certainly share some more information regarding uh, knowledge base articles which which explain it in more detail another one for you gary how many megabytes of ram would be recommended for gui with crank storyboard how much does the washing machine demo use okay so when you saw in the um, in the ui um it's kind of hard to to to, to flip back and show you but the, we put we were predicting the user interface in the designer something like nine megabytes um that was by virtue of all of these uh, these large images were queuing for the animation so um the the real answer is it depends uh, it depends on a number of factors uh the complexity and the number of images the level of caching that we're enabling um and also uh you know in raw terms the size of the display of the screen itself so um we require one or two frame buffers uh, and that those will be at uh, a minimum of uh, RGB 565, so 16 bit. Uh, and it depends on the number of pixels on a display. So, um, you know, it's the number of X pixels times Y pixels times the uh, color depth. And uh, uh, it's a, it's a, quite a complicated uh, answer, but, uh, you know, we, we, we do have customers in production running on um, on devices with the uh, the RT 1064, for example, and that has one megabyte of onboard flash, uh, 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 four megs of onboard flash and one meg, meg of onboard SRAM, um, and they're they're successfully running in uh, you know uh, on a, a I think it's a 320 by 240 size display uh, on internal resources only. So um it can be done uh but it you know it just depends on the the complexity of your, of your uh, user interface and the number of images and fonts that are being used so it's not an exact answer but uh i hope that helps thanks gary all right with that we'll go ahead and close today's call i want to thank all of our panelists for their time today and i want to especially thank all of you for joining this webinar today hope you have a nice day <laughs>